All right, Jesse. Yes, today we are going to be talking about the Unitarian Universalist Church. Uh, tell me, do you know anything about the Unitarians? Yeah, I mean, so I don't know if this has come up before, but I'm actually Jewish. Did you know that? I did not know that. Yeah. Shalom. Happy Passover. Uh, yeah, Jews have had some beef with Christians over the years. Uh, but Unitarian Universalist, my stereotype is they're the more like hippie-ish, everyone's welcome, pro-LGBT. I'm like less worried about them than I am other Christians, basically. Well, they're not Christians. So, um, that's your first misconception. Wait, what? What are they? Yeah, they don't have any, any particular dogma. We'll get into the specifics in a little while, but I've been to one Unitarian ser- service. This was a few years ago when I moved to a new town, the town where I live in now. And I was trying to sample all of the cultural offerings in the neighborhood. Honestly, there's not that much to choose from. Uh, that included a Unitarian Universalist church. And this was a novel experience for me because I've, very, very little experience in any kind of church. Although I did once take communion at a Catholic wedding because I was hungry and I wanted to try the little wafer thing. I tur- <laughs> you keep getting into the back line. Go over and over. <laughs> oh, that was for the wine. Oh, man. I had too much body of Christ <laughs> yesterday. Anyway, it turns out that's a big no-no. But as you can tell, I was raised by atheists. So attending any kind of church was just like – I thought it would be an interesting cultural experience. And the sermon didn't particularly resonate with me. Like – I did appreciate that the minister didn't discuss God or Jesus or heaven or hell at all. And this, but the songs were kind of bland, you know, kind of kumbaya kind of things. But I did sit beside a literal blue haired teenager with a they them pen. And at one point their emotional support golden retriever put his head on my lap. So all in all. <laughs> Wait, that story is true. Every, every aspect of that. That actually happened. Yes. And they have cookies afterwards. So I would say – I brought my emotional support dog in case I got too worked uh-huh. up by the Unitarian Universalist Service. So I would say it was a pretty good religious experience. So this is the domination we're going to be discussing today. They might be – you said they're Christian. I think they're like Christian adjacent. Ish. Yeah, they're Christian-ish. I, I think that like hardcore – like my in-laws would probably f- fervently deny that Unitarians are c- Christian. They also deny that Catholics are Christian. So take that as you will. Yeah. Um, but the reason that we're going to be talking about them today is because – the Unitarian Universalist Church has been going through a, a bit of a reckoning. They were, you know, it seems like everyone's been going through a wet reckoning except for this podcast. We haven't reckoned at all. No, we refuse to reckon. No reckoning here. Okay, so what happened? Okay, so our main character today is a woman named Kate Rohde. So she currently lives in Pennsylvania, and she's basically the stereotype of a Unitarian minister. She was born and raised in Oregon, the daughter of a college professor and a social activist. She went to Reed College. Do you know anything about Reed? My stereotype of Reed was that it's like sort of like hippie-ish for like independent-minded smart kids. Is that right? Yeah, I think that's true. It's got maybe a little bit of the vibe of Evergreen in terms of the social justice stuff, but a lot it's a lot more rigorous and more expensive. Uh, so Kate went to Reed, and then she served as a social worker for a few years before getting a master's degree in religion from the University of Chicago and entering the seminary. And when she was in the pulpit, she gave sermons on things like the civil rights movement, school integration, and uh, Reinhold Niebuhr, who's Obama's favorite theologian. She looks like she'd be at home manning the the phones in an NPR pledge drive. Like if you close your eyes and picture a Unitarian minister, it's Kate Rohde. Okay. She has served as a minister all over the place, Georgia, British Columbia, Texas, Florida, California, Oklahoma, Pennsylvania. And in the 80s, she was one of the first and only female ministers in the South. And one of the things that attracted Kate to that particular faith was its humanitarian values. So she's a lifelong advocate for human rights. Uh, she told me that when she was 14, Robert Kennedy came to her town to stump for a pro-war Democrat. And he thought it would be cute to call on a high school student during this rally. So he called on her and she asked him why he was choosing his party over his principles. And Damn. that made the local paper. Yeah. So she's always been a bit of a shitster. Later, uh, she was an activist for gay rights while it was still dangerous. She officiated a lesbian wedding in Georgia in 1982. Holy crap. Do you think if, if you're, you're a lesbian, right? Uh, usually, yeah. If you're hosting or, or, or organizing a lesbian wedding in rural Georgia in 1982, is it either we're terrified, let's get in and out of there while we can, or is it like, fuck it, this is so reckless, let's just go crazy and throw a big party? Which would you do? Well, I would never do that because I would never want to be the center of attention like that. My wedding had a dog in attendance. But she – this wedding, it was – she told me it was these like working class women. This was not like a – even really a political stand. This were just some, you know, regular old gals, you know, some Barbaras getting married. That's like fucking heroic to 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 officiate a gay wedding in rural Georgia in 1982. Mm-hmm. That's like braver than anything I will ever True. Do. Uh, she also spent years volunteering in El Salvador and other parts of Central America. 
she was working – this is in the 80s, so she was working with communities that have been ravaged by civil war. And the theory was that these places would be less likely to be attacked if there was an American there. So she was basically there as a human shield. Human shield. Yeah. And wow. then back home in the U.S., she went across the country speaking about paramilitary death squads and trying to alert Americans about what was happening in Central America and their own government's involvement in it. Yeah, this was a big – I mean, I guess some of our younger listeners won't know, but that uh, during the Reagan years – we funded these paramilitary groups that would like kill nuns and stuff. And, uh, mm-hmm. Blotter reported, um, we're actually neutral on that question. We try not to get involved in <laughs> politics. And then more recently, she started volunteering with immigration activists during the Trump administration. She persuaded her county officials to stop working with ICE. She says she's faced men with guns, threats from the government. She was once detained and deported from Mexico while she was doing human rights work in border towns. All of this is to say she's not just a reverend, she's an activist. And she shares the UUA's commitment to issues of social justice. And this, in part, is why her expulsion from the denomination came as such a shock. What could that woman have done to get expelled from the church? That sounds crazy. Jesse, we will get there shortly. Before we do, you need to know some background on the Unitarian Universalist Association. So the UUA was officially founded in 1961 with the merger of two separate faiths, the American Unitarian Association and the Universalist Church of America. And it's unlike other religious institutions. Each individual congregation is autonomous and self-governing. So while there are shared values, including things like freedom, reason, and tolerance, it has no specific creed or dogma. That's why I said it wasn't Christian. I might have been wrong about that. Like there's no requirement or even a recommendation that parishioners believe in a higher power. So some members do worship God or gods and consider themselves Christian or Muslim or Jewish or Buddhist, etc., but it might be one of the few churches in America that actively wel- welcomes atheists and not just to convert them huh. or burn them at the stake. Yeah. It's a truly liberal institution. It's open-minded with respect for differing opinions. There's a commitment to free expression, et cetera. And this in particular comes from the Unitarian side of the Uni- Unitarian Universalist Association. So as Kate told me, the Unitarians pioneered free religion in the 16th century when everyone else was burning people alive. And that's literal. So Michael Servetus, he was a Spanish theologian who Unitarians think of as their sort of spiritual and intellectual founder. He was burned at the stake for heresy, and supposedly his own writings were used to fuel the fire. This is why I'm glad people don't have printers at home anymore. I do. I I burn your shit all the time. Burn my tweets. Okay, so as part of how do you how do you read long stuff? I can't like it could be my rapidly aging eyes, but I've never been able to read like super long magazine articles on a backlit screen. Do you do that? Uh. Yeah, I read them on my well, or I read them on my Kindle if I like really care. Yeah, Kindle. Yeah, you can't, but it's always you can't always get. Okay, it was a fascinating segue, but continue. Okay, so as part of these liberal Enlightenment values, tolerance of dissenting views has always been paramount to the mission of the UA. This is embodied. They have this oft-repeated adage: "We don't have to think alike to love alike." But while that might be true in theory, in practice, it's changing. So today, the membership of the UUA UUA is overwhelmingly progressive. There's a not small contingent of parishioners who would probably say that Democrats are too conservative, but you're more likely to see a non-binary teenager with an emotional support golden retriever than a MAGA Republican. It wasn't always like this. I talked to a guy who's been in the church since the 80s, and he told me that they used to have cops there, used to have Republicans there. In a way, it was a lot more diverse than it is now, and also it's probably much whiter. But in terms of diversity of thought – They're losing that now. And of course, lots of churches are homogenous, but the UUA was built on diversity of thought. And so as the membership has grown more ideologically rigid, some members say it's also become more liberal. And the church has been roiled by many of the same conflicts that are apparent in other progressive institutions in recent years. You know what I'm talking about, right, Jesse? You want to spell it out for the people? I mean, there have been numerous meltdowns. I'd say the largest number of meltdowns focus on race and then maybe sex and gender and trans rights is the the second biggest issue that has caused meltdowns within liberal organizations. Yeah, that's the recurring theme of this podcast. And this thing that has happened to so many other cultural institutions, let's call it the Great Awakening, uh, it actually came early to the UUA. In 1997, for instance, at the UUA's General Assembly, that's this big annual meeting of members and leaders from across the denomination, 
They voted on a resolution calling for the institution to become explicitly anti-racist. And of course, that's a term that has since entered the wider society. But at the time, this was not well known outside of academia and activism. Do you remember the first time you heard the term anti-racist, Jesse? I don't, but there has been that. I mean, 1997 is very early to use it in this way because I, I had always just understood it as like, uh, it's like, of course you're anti-racist. You're, you're also anti-evil. Right. Um, I think right. largely because of Ibram X. Kendi's work, it, it took on this almost more spiritual understanding that like, you know, just being neutral or not chiming in isn't enough. You have to be anti, actively anti-racist and it has to manifest. Or you're racist. Yeah. Like in your daily life. And it is, it's a little religious, I think. Yeah. So I first heard the term. I remember I heard it. Actually, I was at the same bar in Durham where I, uh, where I learned about sounding and heard about this woman's custody battle over her children. Um, I heard, heard, first heard about it because people in the queer scene in Durham were going out to San Francisco to do these anti-racism trainings. And I thought that sounded really silly. Like, you know, it was like, okay, just don't be racist. Obviously, my understanding of the term was very limited. Um, but in 1997, that resolution passed at the UUA. But even then, there was pushback, including from this famed UUA theologian named Reverend Fandiga. She herself is black. She's a social justice activist. And in 1999, so two years after that resolution to become anti-racist passed, she used her speech at the next General Assembly to criticize the UUA's embrace of anti-racism. So she described attending an anti-racism training and the lessons that training imparted. So all white people are racist. Black people, by definition, cannot be racist. And, quote, whites must be shown that they are racist and confess their racism. And she found these lessons incompatible with UUA principles. She also found it dangerous because through these lessons, white people, she was afraid white people would learn to think of themselves as racist. And she called her speech, yeah. Why Anti-Racism Will Fail. 1999. Huh. This is, so they were like uh, 20 years ahead on all this culture war bullshit. Absolutely. And in the years since Dr. Thandika gave that speech, anti-racism has spread to every corner of American institutions well beyond Unitarianism. It's in media, medicine, government, education, law, even sports. And in the UUA, she clearly lost that debate. Anti-racism is now a guiding principle, and it's very much in the mold of this sort of Robin D'Angelo thinking. And in fact, her book, White Fragility, was published by a Unitarian press. Did you know that? I did not, no. So they've ex embraced exactly the things that Reverend Thandika was warning about. And this has led to a schism that threatens to tear the UUA apart. And it ultimately led to the defrocking of several UUA leaders, including Kate Rohde. Okay, so what? What? how did this go down? What happened? We will get to that. Before we do, we need to jump to the 2017 General Assembly. This was held in New Orleans. And that GA, General Assembly, was more dramatic than usual. So outside the conference... Two UUA employees were hospitalized after being assaulted and robbed by four young men. And then inside, things weren't going much better because over the preceding months, the UUA had been rocked by allegations of institutional racism and white supremacy. And this stemmed from a controversial hiring decision. So basically what happened was that a white male candidate was hired to lead the UUA's southern region over a Latina woman. And that woman and her supporters alleged that she was passed over because of her race. So word spread, the white guy declined the job offer, and the, at the time, president of the UUA, Peter Morales, he himself was the first Latino to serve in that, in that role. He resigned from that post, and the board voted to replace him with three social justice advocates, all of whom were black. And then a month later, the board of trustees passed a resolution declaring that the UUA was a white supremacist culture. This seems of a piece with a lot of these meltdowns where, it's just sort of complicated personnel decisions and it's not really clear exactly where like the ironclad evidence of racism is, but it is the institution's job to, if anything, trump up the accusation. Like, yep, we're super racist. We, we, it's like you have to confess to it whether or not there's evidence is true. Exactly. So at the General Assembly in New Orleans, this was the first all congregation gathering since Morales's resignation. And the conference was dominated by this internal reckoning. And shit got pretty weird. Like during one session, a board member explained the process of replacing Peter Morales with these three candidates. He said, quote, as we were making decisions about how to fill the role of the, of the presidency, some of us were blinded. I was blinded by my whiteness. And it was our colleagues on the board of color and others with great wisdom who saw a different way. Had it not been for that vision and had it not been for some mighty big sunglasses to help with that blindness, 
why then we would not have wound up with this fabulous group of co-presidents. Then, a little while later, he speaks again. I just made a giant mistake. For those of you who have visual problems, I apologize for my analogy to blindness. Wait, can I say, I can say Jesus, right? Through Unitarians. <laughs> yeah, they don't, they don't have a problem with that. He asked his colleagues for forgiveness and promised to do better. And terminology was a recurring theme at that year's GA. So delegates also approved a motion to change the name of a public advocacy campaign. It was called Standing on the Side of Love to Side of Love to be more inclusive of people who can't stand. It's dumb in 2023 for me to even ask this question, but they they understand words can have multiple definitions and meanings, right? And that you can use no. context. Okay. No. <laughs> well, there you have it. <laughs> also, can I just say um, – one thing I love about this weird sort of like condescending mode of speech from like white liberal allies is, um, okay. So as we were making decisions about how to fill the role of the presidency, some of us were blinded. I was blinded by my whiteness and it was our colleagues on the board of color and others with great wisdom who saw a different way. You could literally swap that out with like a magical wizard. Mm-hmm. And yeah. it was a magical wizard with great wisdom who saw a different way. It's just, you're not actually treating your colleagues of color like, human beings, you're treating them as these like mystical fountains of knowledge, which is not It's racist. It's not actually, it's condescending. It, it's it's yeah, it's like benevolent racism. It's white supremacy culture. Okay, so plenty of UUA members were on board with all of these changes, but some were not. And this includes a minister in Spokane, Washington, named Todd Eckloff. Jesse, you might actually have met Todd before. Met him how? He was at the Heterodox Conference in Denver last year. That's where I met him. Oh. <laughs> I said that so suspiciously. Okay. Yeah, yeah. maybe I met him. Uh, but I'd been following his story for a few years before that. Okay. So Todd, like Kay Rohde, he's both a Unitarian minister and a social justice activist. At one time, he was most famous in Unitarian circles for refusing to perform heterosexual marriages until same-sex marriage was legal. And he he did this while living in Kentucky. So we're not talking about Seattle or the Castro district. district. And he, he subsequently lost his, his day job over this. Uh, he was later, when he moved to Washington, he was instrumental in the campaign to legalize cannabis in Washington State. Spokane is in a very conservative area, and they and he started this campaign with other um, faith leaders to get out the vote to help legalize cannabis. And that's actually a social justice issue right there. You know, war on drugs and all that. He's helped fund black churches. And what most attracted him to the denomination, he told me, was its culture of extreme tolerance and understanding. So he's super liberal and he's also very progressive. So Todd was at that meeting in 2017 in New Orleans and he'd been watching the UUA move in this direction for a while. So here's what he told me. I was really bothered by what I saw at the 2017 GA. Our main commitment is supposed to be to reason. And what he saw going on at the GA was not based in reason. It was more like this religious fervor. And that might work in so, in some churches, but that's not really a Unitarian value. So Todd wanted to spread the word about what he saw going on. So he wrote and self-published a book called The Gadfly Papers. The book contains three essays, and it was inspired and built around many of the same concepts first covered by Jonathan Haidt and Greg Lukianoff in The Coddling of the American Mind, safetyism, intolerance of deferring ideas, things like that. So in 2019, so that's the next GA, this happened to be in Spokane. Todd brought 200 copies of the book with him and started passing them out from his booth on the Friday afternoon of the conference. By that evening, he had been kicked out of the conference. What, was he wearing a diaper? <laughs> Probably not. So what happened? Okay. Todd says that after he started passing out the book, he was approached by someone in leadership, and he was informed that this book was disrupting the event. Of course, they could not actually have read the book. But they asked with, to meet with him to discuss it. He felt like they were hostile and they weren't approaching him in good faith. And he basically declined and was told not to come back. And so word started to spread about this. And the very next day, the book was condemned by a group of a group called Unitarian Universalist of Color. They wrote an open letter calling it toxic and harmful. And then other affinity groups started publishing similar versions of open letters, including a group of what eventually became 500 white Unitarian ministers. That letter is now known as the White Minister's Letter. Here's a quote from it. We deeply regret the harm this publication has already caused. And we know that this is another intentionally provocative incident that comes on the heels of months, years, generations of harm towards our colleagues of color. We also acknowledge the harm in the treatise directed towards LGBTQ plus people, religious educators, people with disabilities and others, many of whom are also people of color at the intersections of multiple identities. And then later, we recognize that a zealous commitment to scare quotes, logic and reason 
over all other forms of knowing is one of the foundational stones of white supremacy culture. I got it. This this is going to sound weird. This reminds me of a website called Science Based Medicine that was very much a skeptical website. You know, they would debunk supplements. They would talk, you know, these are scientists talking about logic and reason and debate. And then they were just hit with like, like overnight, they just collapsed and became over gender stuff and just became the weirdest outlet where all you see is like this robotic speak. That's what this is. Right. We recognize that Zell's commitment of logic and reason over all of the for- other forms of knowing right there is just like Tumblr academic nonsense is one of the foundational stones of capitalization, capitalized white supremacy culture. It's just a robot could produce this. GPT chat. Woke GPT. Yeah. The KKK chat. <laughs> <laughs> And so once again, this was written right after the conference. I would be shocked if even a small number of the signees had actually read the book in full. And the letter doesn't cite a single example of what makes it so harmful. But this quickly became a huge deal in Unitarian circles, and it was even addressed in some pulpits. So I'm going to play you a clip. This is a sermon given by Reverend Sarah Skoshko in Eugene, Oregon, right after this controversy started. The minister of the Spokane Church, Reverend Todd Eckloff, began distributing a book that he published himself, which is rarely a good sign, (laughs) called The Gadfly Papers. And notably, he didn't hand these out until after, or almost until the end of GA, after he had appeared on stage with a black minister who lavishly praised him for funding their church. He could have handed it out at any time, but he didn't. He asked his congregants to hand the book out at their church's booth and at other locations around GA, and from what I understand, they were not aware of the book's contents. They were not aware that it was racist. And to be clear, I find the Gadfly papers to be very polite. It's also intellectually dishonest. It's dog-whistle racist, dismissive and condescending. It's self-absorbed and self-pitying and morally reprehensible. The lofty tone and polished vocabulary and pretensions at neutrality, as if this is all a thought experiment, cannot redeem the sentiment. I feel like this is all stuff we've been through 20 versions of. So this is someone who probably hasn't read the book, calling it racist, dog whistles, I'm guessing not quoting any specific thing. It's just everyone Everyone knows the book is bad because everyone says the book is bad. Exactly. And by the way, I asked Todd if he asked his congregants to pass out the book. And no, he didn't. He and one other member of the church passed out the books and the other member proofread the book. So this person obviously knew what was in it. She makes it seem like he like ordered his, his congregants to pass out this racist text. And that was the tone. The book was racist. And you don't actually have to read it to know it. And she herself says in this sermon that she was 400 miles away from Spokane when this happened. But, quote, I trust my black colleagues and indigenous, Hispanic, trans, genderqueer, and disabled colleagues. So if they say it's bad, it's bad. I trust the magical wizard to know everything. She really shouldn't have said Hispanic. She should have said Latinx. Do you think she had indigenous, Hispanic, trans, genderqueer, and disabled colleagues, all of whom were mad about it? It was actually just one person who was all of those. Yes, one very intersectional person. <laughs> So over the next year or so, Todd was basically unpersoned. He was formally censured by the Unitarian Universalist Ministers Association. He was fired from a teaching position at a Unitarian theological school, and he was ultimately disfellowshipped, which is like the Unitarian version of being defrocked. Disfellowship. Yeah. What a word. He also nearly lost his ministry in Spokane, but ultimately a majority of his congregants decided to stick with him. And another of ministers around the country stuck their necks out for him, which brings us brings us back to Kate Rohde. Okay, how does she factor in? Okay, while all this was happening, Unitarians dis- gathered to discuss what was going on, and they did it naturally on Facebook and via email. So Kate retired in 2014, but she was active in her former church and in Unitarian Facebook groups, and this was a big topic of conversation. A lot of people were uncomfortable with Todd and the book and a common refrain in these groups was that Todd was racist, homophobic, transphobic, ableist, etc. But what Kate kept noticing was that a lot of these people who were making these accusations against Todd hadn't actually read the book. They freely admitted that. They discouraged other people from reading it too. So she decided to actually read the book. And when she did, she couldn't find anything that was racist, homophobic, transphobic, ableist, etc. So she read it again, and she got more and more disturbed at both the reaction to the book 
and what she saw as leaders forsaking due process in order to punish Todd for wrong thing. Have you read this this book that is so racist? I assume it was actually called like Mind Todd. <laughs> I have read it. It's definitely intended for a Unitarian audience, not a lay audience. So there were parts of it that I just sort of glazed over, but it's not bigoted at all. Like it's basically an homage to the coddling of the American mind from a Unitarian perspective. And oftentimes when he criticizes people, he doesn't even actually name them. He goes out of his way to sort of be kind. And when Kate read the book and realized this, she called Todd Eckloff to lend her support and ask what she could do. She's an old activist, right? She wanted to help someone in need. Yeah. So she gets together with a group of like-minded UUA ministers, and they write a letter to the Ministers Association, and they get about 70 clergy to sign it, although I should note that most of them were retired. And one of their concerns was that the Unitarian Universalist Ministers Association, so the UUMA, didn't follow protocol when centering Todd Eckloff. Their letter gets leaked and posted online. So not long after that, the UUMA holds a vote that would make disciplining people like Todd easier. And so Kate and her allies decide they're going to attend. <laughs> Wait, that's, that's their response yeah. to you didn't follow protocol before like destroying this person's reputation. Their response is, okay, let's make sure we can do that in the future while following protocol. We'll change the protocol. Yeah. Right. So Kate and her allies decide they're going to attend this annual meeting and oppose the rule change. But – at the annual meeting, the leadership institutes a new procedure which places POC, trans people, and people with disabilities first in line to speak. And Kate says this effectively made it impossible to have a fair debate about their motion since their supporters were not allowed to speak. <laughs> oh, my God. Later, 13 ministers resigned from the UUMA over what was going on. And to Kate and her allies, what was going on was basically a, a denial of freedom of belief and due process – but the UMA passes these new guidelines to make it easier to discipline troublemakers. So how do they loosen the guidelines to make these witch hunts easier in the future? Okay, for example, so previously ministers facing some kind of disciplinary action had a right to a lawyer under the new rules they didn't. And when Kate spoke up against this, she, she says she was publicly chastised for causing trauma to people of color. That makes sense because because historically due process and access to lawyers has been something – people of color have hated and it traumatizes them. Exactly. And during this period, there are more heated discussions about what's going on on Facebook. And in the fall of 2020, Kate gets a call from a minister who says he represents three other ministers, including Sarah Skotchko. That's the one you heard earlier preaching against Todd Ekloff. And these three ministers, these, they're all women, are claiming that Kate caused them harm because of what she posted in these Facebook groups. People need to just fucking grow up, man. Every, every, any kind of disagreement is just, you're harming me. And it's so, it's so hard to be on the other side of that. Cause like we don't, we have too much dignity to be like, oh, you're harming me by disagreeing with me. It's just, it's such a potent, pathetic weapon. Take off your diaper and put on your pants. <laughs> put on your big boy pants. Yeah. So Kate's hard of hearing and she has to get an explanation of what rules she broke and what and the evidence that she broke these rules in writing. And she's told that giving that information out is is not part of the new guidelines that they passed. And over the next few months, she tries to get clarification about this new accountability process, as they called it. But the answers that she gets, she says they're vague and as are the actual allegations against her. But at what point in this story does Stalin rise from the grave and be like, this is a little too far even for me, guys? <laughs> it also reminds me a little bit of like the Title IX stuff where you're not even allowed to know like what you're being accused of. Yeah, I thought the same thing. So Kate told me that disputing the charges wasn't actually given to her as an option. The only option was to confess. So she refuses to participate in this sham trial or sham accountability process. And she's suspended from her lifetime membership in the UUMA. So she's accused of something. She's not sure exactly what. They won't give her the charges in writing. Her only option is to confess. When she refuses to confess, she's suspended. Exactly. Sounds like a healthy organization. Mm -hmm. And then a few months after her membership in the UUMA was suspended, she finds out that these three reverends who accused her – and got her suspended from the Ministers Association, also filed a complaint with the Ministerial Fellowship Committee. And this time, they have a 72-page document with a multitude of allegations, mostly without evidence included. So there's now a reverend appointed by the Ministerial Fellowship Committee investigating Kate. So Kate does a Zoom call with the investigator. And then a couple months later, the investigator files her report, which is basically just the complaints and Kate's response to them. So no actual investigation. 
So it's basically just like a she said, she said, and it's based almost entirely on these Facebook comments, which these three women who complained were saying were harmful. Okay, so again, they use this word harmful. Usually if someone says words were harmful, you'd think they were like calling you slurs or threatening you or something like that. I, I mean, take it that didn't happen here. She's a 73-year-old Unitarian minister, Jesse. What do you think? She's based on everything you've told me about her. Um, she seems like a deeply vindictive, if not violent person, so it wouldn't shock me at this point. Very bigoted, yes. Okay, so she was critical in, in these comments. She was critical of someone leadership, and she used terms like ideologue, autocrat, dysfunction. She called someone's sermon snarky. But this wasn't on a public forum. This was in a private Facebook group for people who supported Todd Ekloff. What she didn't know was that this group had interlopers. So while she thought she was having private conversations, people who opposed Todd Eklov were watching, and it turns out, reporting back to leadership. So that was the worst of it that I saw, like calling people ideologue, autocrat, dysfunction, stuff like that. But the investigation also accused her of posting false statements to these groups. What kinds of false statements? Okay, here's an example from the investigation. Kate posted, People who spoke up for treating Todd Ekloff according to our rules of contact were harassed, bullied, unfriended, and kicked out of forums. So the complainant who moderated one of these groups said this was false, and Kate wasn't kicked out of her particular group because of her views. She was kicked out for breaking the rules of the group, including posting articles that would cause debate. I have to say, I've seen these Facebook posts, and while I can see, like, as a Facebook moderator, how Kate might have been a pain in the ass, nothing about her behavior is bullying or harassment, etc., so this seems pretty trumped up, like just an attempt to find some justification to punish her. Yeah. In another post, she said, quote, several of us, end quote, were kicked out of Facebook groups for basically expressing unpopular ideas about things like CRT, Todd Eklov and the like. And according to the complainant, it was two people, not several people who were kicked out of this group. <laughs> Liar. So, yeah. It's a lot of shit like that. The complainants claim it's defamation. So probably the most serious allegation outside of Facebook is that she interfered with and harmed Sarah Skochko's church. So Sarah Skochko, again, that's the reverend who gave the sermon about Todd Ekloff and, and Eugene that I played you. So what happened is that Skochko, she got a job at a church in Austin. A couple who had been members of that church left the church when they heard that she was going to be joining. They reached out to Kate because Kate had been their minister eight years before. So they trusted her. She had been their pastor. But instead of emailing Kate, they emailed another minister's email address. So with the Unitarian Church, like your your the, the email address for the minister will be like minister at church dot org, right? It doesn't the the email address doesn't the, stays with the church. It doesn't leave with the minister. Yep. So they emailed the wrong minister. And this gets back to Scotchco. She's pissed because she says that Kate is interfering with her church. Does that make sense to you? Yeah, it does. Okay, regardless, Kate didn't end up talking to these people because she didn't get the email anyway. And so to her, all the claims against her, so bullying, lying, defamation, these are just a pretext to get rid of her, while really the problem is that she disagrees with, with them on some of these political and social issues. And so to her, this is a violation of just the basic tenets of Unitarian Universalism. And so, like, how problematic was she? Okay, on a scale of, like, non-binary they fab who lives in a polycule and doesn't talk to their dad because he voted for Trump but still cashes his checks, to Jordan Peterson tweeting about how fat models aren't pretty, she's like a five. Like, maybe maybe like a four. She's, like, slightly more problematic than you and significantly less problematic than me. Like, she thinks the term Latinx is stupid. So do the vast majority of Hispanic people. She posted an article by the feminist current by an indigenous woman who argues that the whole idea that First Nations people have like five genders isn't true and that women should have their own spaces. She also thinks that trans people deserve legal protections and access to health care, housing, employment, etc. She's like basic bar pod listener problematic. Hell yeah. Yeah. What was the, so what was the result of this, this crazy semi investigation? So after the investigation concluded, there was a hearing with an executive committee and they issued a report. And this concluded that not only did Kate violate these policies and hurt these ministers' feelings, she wasn't willing to take responsibility for it. So basically, she wasn't willing to admit culpability. And they recommended that she be disfellowshipped. And she was last fall. So that's a double disfellowshipification between her and Ekoff. Wow. And I take it that's pretty rare. Very, very rare. So usually the sort of thing that would result in a disfellowship is like criminal misconduct. The UUA, they have a list. Well, but in a sense, didn't she commit yeah. a lot of multiple violent acts? Facebook crimes. 
So the UA has a list of all the ministers who have been disfellowshipped since 1968 on its website. It's not a long list, but it's like sexual misconduct, sexual misconduct with minor, criminal conviction for statutory rape and kidnapping, criminal possession of child pornography, sexual misconduct, sexual misconduct, sexual misconduct. And then there's Todd Eckloff and Kate Rohde. Wait, so what does it say? What does it say on the website for what they did? So for Todd, it says removed for non-cooperation and then in parentheses, bullying and abusive behavior. And for Kate, removed for defaming and interfering in the Ministry of Colleagues. Okay, so she's been disfellowshipped, but you said she was retired. So how does this like affect her? Well, besides the reputational damage, which is very real, I should note she's also the only woman on that list. She loses money. She no longer has access to special funds for retired ministers. And she loses opportunities to do these sort of freelance ministerial gigs that did make up a significant portion of her income. But besides the financial stuff... She just feels like this institution that she devoted her life to both betrayed her and its own values. And she says this has been just horrible to watch. The reason she was a Unitarian, or a a big part of the reason, was this commitment to diversity and embracing people even when you disagree with them. That's the thing that they like to say. We need not to think alike to love alike. So she's trying to raise money for a lawyer right now. She's got a a GoFundMe going. Uh, We'll link to that in the show notes. And this is not just about her or her case. This is about what's going on in the church including forsaking these long-held processes. Like, for example, in 2016, the Board of Trustees gave $5.3 million to a group called Black Lives of UU without a vote of the board. They also forsook Robert's Rules of Order. This was very unusual. They said they set aside the rules because POC activists were frustrated with the, this is a quote, emphasis on process over content and meaning. That's a quote from an article about this in the magazine UU World. There were some concerns from outside the board about conflicts of interest in this decision. For instance, the board member who made the motion to give this group $5.3 million is the minister for the church that serves as Black Lives of UU's fiscal agent. And as you can imagine, this was very troubling to people like Kate who think you should, you know, follow rules and processes when giving people millions of dollars. And she's definitely not alone here. I spoke to or corresponded with over a dozen Unitarians, both reverends and lay people and white people and POC. And they painted a very familiar portrait of a liberal institution being captured and everything else that comes along with it, including the backlash and the backlash to the backlash and the backlash to the backlash to the backlash. We've heard this story before. There's hostility, shunning, lost friendships. I heard from people who ended up leaving their churches. I heard from a woman who was in one of Kate's meetings with the Ministerial Fellowship Committee. She described it as surreal. She said, it's the closest I've come to experiencing the cult-like obeisance of people to a very destructive ideal while professing love. Damn. Yeah. One thing I did find interesting was that almost not all, but a lot of the people I spoke to were absolutely willing to be named. I just haven't seen that often when I've reported on similar trends in other institutions, not just retired people, people either. But still, these folks are definitely in the minority. And that is not to say that the uber wokes, for lack of a better term, are in the majority either. I don't think that they are. Most people in the church are just living their lives. They're not paying that much attention to it. But the uber wokes are in positions of leadership, and leadership has done things to prevent anyone who challenges their specific doctrine or dogma from gaining power. How do they do that? Okay. For instance, here's what one UUA member told me. Todd Eckloff had planned to run for president of the board this year, but so many office goals were put in his way that it was impossible. He had to be endorsed by 50 congregations to get on the ballot, but he wasn't allowed to solicit support until almost until the ballot deadline because that was seen as campaigning. So, of course, to the to the UUA and the UMA, that's the Ministers Association and the Ministerial Fellowship Committee. There's too many acronyms in this story, <laughs> but to, to, to the leadership There's another side to this story. So I reached out to them for comment, and they sent back some boilerplate. We don't comment on members. They also said, quote, we can share that the UUMA is intentionally working towards being actively anti-oppressive and anti-racist. As an association, that work is part of our purpose. The members of the UUMA have voted to affirm our purpose and have elected leaders to the board. One of the truths of attempting to live as an anti-racist organization is that it is our job as leadership to center the voices of those who have been marginalized both in our association and in our country. Sorry, I blacked out during this because it's just more yeah. like, could have been written by a woke AI thing. Yeah. It's interesting that they say marginalized when I can think of exactly two people who've been marginalized by this and it's Todd Eckloff and, and Kate Rohde. <laughs> yeah. So it's obvious that a lot of people in this church, particularly in leadership, fully support these changes. There's a movement right now to eliminate the church's current principles and replace them with these sort of woke anti-racist platitudes. And the people who oppose this and other current trends, so people like Todd Eckloff and Kate Rohde and their supporters, 
they really are portrayed by some of their colleagues as literal bigots. So here's a clip from a YouTube video by Sarah Skochko. Again, that's the reverend who, pe- who preached against Todd Eckloff and uh, also complained about Kate Rohde. Gadflyism is a movement in Unitarian Universalism. The name comes from the book The Gadfly Papers, written by now disfellowshipped minister Reverend Todd Eckloff, and distributed by surprise at the 2019 General Assembly in Spokane, Washington. You should know that a fair number of people who subscribe to Gadflyism don't necessarily call themselves Gadflies, but for better or worse, that's the term that I've heard most frequently used for people who subscribe to that particular ideology, and we'll talk about what it is in a minute. Anyway, the term term comes from the book. The Gadfly Papers didn't invent a new ideology. It just echoed some pretty racist and hateful sentiments that have been brewing in Unitarian Universalism for a while now. So it resonated with a small minority of our people, mostly white men, and unfortunately, it galvanized them. It's crazy. It reminds me of the Primo episode we just did about like Asia Romano just sort of lying about shit she hasn't read. It's the same thing of just like you repeat it over and over and over again without engaging with the text at all. If you wanted to call something toxic, I would say it would be this. And she goes on to say the gadflies, as she calls them. She says they're opposed to social justice and that they cynically reframe issues of social justice to being about free speech. And they, quote, center themselves as heroes. She also calls them the alt-right wing of the Unitarian movement. <laughs> yeah, the Richard Spencer of Unitarianism. Yeah, Kate Rohde is very right wing. Yeah, the one who is like... Helping people affected by the Contras in Nicaragua, yeah. It's all very familiar criticism, and you hear it any time people complain about institutional capture, wokeness, anti-racism, etc. And she does that thing. You've heard it before. She says that they want to stop social justice work so they can say things that are racist, transphobic, ableist, etc. Yeah, it's like a common playbook of just not not um, engaging with any of the substances of these critiques. Yeah, and, and Sarah, by the way, so she got this job as head minister at a church in, on Austin in 2020. Her tenure was not without controversy. Uh, a segment of that congregation was unhappy about this. They left to form their own break-off congregation. And then less than six months after getting there, she was fired. Well, what, why was she fired? I don't know the details. I assume – this is a total assumption. I assume it has something to do with the fact that people didn't like her. <laughs> maybe she – or maybe it turns out she's the biggest racist <laughs> of all. So she's now working on a book tentatively called Hate Disguise as Freedom – the rise of the gadfly movement in Unitarian Universalism. <laughs> it also, it's like a little bit about how like, um, it like turns disagreement into like a, cons- like mm-hmm. this, this evil movement of the gadflies. Well, this dude just fucking wrote a self-published book that he handed out that you don't have to, anyway. Yeah, I reached out to her for comment. She declined to speak with me. Uh, and while I was working on this, I posted in a Facebook group for folks who are mostly supportive of Todd Eckloff and Kate Rohde. Uh, and someone in that group apparently took my post and posted it into a different group for people who are not supportive of them. And I got an email from a reverend who was like, I'm not a gladfly. You need to reach out to more than just the people who don't sympathize with this point of view. And I wrote her back and I was like, yeah, I reached out to, you know, the minister's association, but I would love to hear your perspective if you'd like to talk. And she never responded. I thought that was interesting. Um, I also reached out to Black Lives of UU. I didn't hear back from them either. So I don't want to pretend that this is both sides of the story. It's not. But again, it's hard to tell both sides when one side won't talk to you. So what are the uh, the gadflies or whoever? What do they want to happen? Well, it depends. Um, you know, I spoke to a a bunch of different Unitarians. They're from churches all over the country and they have different ideas. So some want to get more of their allies in leadership, although that's hard to do because they're being smeared as racist and current leadership is actively opposing them and making it harder. Others want to split off from the UUA and form their own thing. And that includes Todd Eckloff. So he recently formed a new organization called the North American Unitarian Association, and they focus on old school enlightenment values, freedom, reason and tolerance and racism. And racism. And Kate, for her part, she just wants to see a return to classic UUism, as she calls it. She basically told me, I would like to return to those old principles while continuing to evolve in a way that makes the church more appealing and affirming to people regardless of class or ethnicity. She said, quote, this isn't done by intolerance or meanness. It's done by enlarging the pie. But she's not optimistic that this is going to happen. She said, I don't know how it will turn out. I am old and have struggled long to uphold values that have fallen out of favor. And then just last week, she found out that she is being excluded from a book about feminism and women ministers. It's being published by Unitarian Press called Skinner House. 
And they told the editor that unless Kate was excluded, they were going to kill the book. And I, I did. They, yeah. They told the editor that you have to like unper, like just erase this very important, important person from UU history or you'll kill the whole book. This is psychotic. Yeah. And I verified that with the editor and Kate's pissed about this for good reason. She's 73 years old. She was a second wave women's lib feminist type. She battled sexism for many years of her career and now she's being written out of history. That's a, that's a infuriating story. Yeah. So one last note. So Todd wrote and published a second book about this, about what happened. This one's called The Gadfly Affair, A 21st Century Heretic's Excommunication from America's Most Liberal Religion. And we will post links to both his books and Kate's GoFundMe in the show notes. Well, good luck to them. It sounds like they've been through a very, very crazy cancellation. Yeah. It was uh, pretty depressing to talk to people involved in this church, but it's also – we've seen this in so many other institutions. And I don't know that there's going to be any springing back from this one. Uh, the UUA has been captured for a long time. Yeah. And, uh, they seem to have a lot of, r- of real true believers. This, these things like seem to only – well – it's complicated. In journalism, it's often not permanent. Like organizations can swing back, but there's like specific reasons for that. Like for liberal it's institutions, trendier, yeah, yeah I, it's harder for them to swing back once they've fallen in this sense. Anything else, Katie? That's it. This has been Blotch Reported. As always, we are produced with help from Tracy Woodgrains and the mysterious Lex. I'm Jesse Single, and remember... And I'm Katie Herzog, and also remember... Jesse, take off the diaper, put on your pants, and put down the goddamn air horn.